All right. Uh, so hopefully we can end the predictive modeling part today. And then uh, Thursday, this Thursday, we can talk about the specs of the first project. Uh, so the fun part begins. So last time what we did, oh, it's okay. So the for the past couple of weeks, what we've been going through is the how to, the A, A from A to Z of the predictive modeling, starting from defining the tasks, uh, data processing and modeling. And so far uh, we've covered, last time what we've covered is the deep learning approach, the preliminaries, what uh, just uh, uh, how the neural networks, how, how a single neuron is just like a logistic regression. And then if you, and then, so this is like, just like a logistic regression. And then you add a hidden layer and that becomes a ensemble of logistic regressions. If the hidden layer uses, if the hidden layer uses a nonlinear activation function, uh, the sigmoid function as the nonlinear activation function, and we, and if the uh, if the uh, representation vector, so this was the uh, representation vector for the a single admission. So we are still using the example admission readmission prediction. So our input. It was a 40,000 dimensional vector here. Uh, oh, actually, yeah, it was a 40,000 dimensional vector where the values were either zero or ones. So especially when the values are binary, then a single hidden, a single hidden layer can be seen as just a sum of uh, some of an embedding that corresponds to the dimensions or the features that has one as a value. So in this case, we use the uh, this this corresponding, uh, the second row, which corresponds to the second feature uh, is active. And then the, uh, again, and again, and again, and then we just simply sum them up. So that becomes our hidden layer. And then of course we have to put that through a activation function, nonlinear activation function. So that becomes our hidden representation. So hidden representation is the one, that is the one that is being pushed to the final prediction, which is the sigmoid function. So unlike the previous part, unlike, unlike the logistic, uh, logistic regression where we directly push the 40,000 dimensional vector into the logistic function, instead of that, we're pushing that through a lower dimensional, four dimensional space. And then that is being pushed into the logistic function. So that's the fundamental difference between uh, neural network approach versus just a linear approach. So I'm just going to skip this one, and uh, yeah, and the optimization is still the same using backprop, uh, using the backpropagation based on the chain rule, and the objective function is still a maximum likelihood estimation. So, and the last part was how uh, Theano, TensorFlow, PyTorch, all of these auto uh, autograd packages do that for you, so you don't have to write your optimization update functions yourself. So today we're gonna to finally go through the recurrent neural network, RNN, and hopefully we all know what RNN is, but uh, uh, what we, uh, for those who uh, participate, att attended my uh, programming, for, programming for AI course last semester, uh, we've already gone through RNN, GRU, LSTM, and we've also done sequence to sequence and all that, but uh, this time, what we're doing is we're going to use RNN to handle a sequence of visits. So now it's uh, it's a bit more longitudinal. Before, what we were doing with the readmission prediction was that we were trying to predict whether a patient would return back to the hospital within 30 days after discharge. So, and our our input value was based on a single admission, a blue strip, if you remember, a single blue strip is what we've used, but so that our input was a fixed size vector. We were able to represent a single admission as a 40,000 dimensional vector uh, comprised of diagnosis codes, medication codes, and procedure codes. So in, so now not, we're not doing that anymore. We, you, as, as you can see here, we're trying to capture a patient representation rather than a admission representation. A single admission, a patient can make a multiple admissions 
over a lifetime. So a single patient can be seen as a sequence of visits or sequence of admissions or encounters in this case. Both, those are like all interchangeable. So a single, so as you can see here, let's assume that our patient, one patient had made three visits to the hospital over time. And in, within each visit, there would be a different number of events happening. So in the first visit, there could be, so let's assume that the, in the first visit, patient was diagnosed with cough and fever. So these two would be diagnosis codes. And then was prescribed with Tylenol, which would be a medication code. And then uh, the patient got IV fluid, so which would be a procedure. So IV fluid being suek man nang gojo, chim de duo so. So two, two diagnosis codes, one medication code and one procedure code. In the second visit, maybe after a month, after two months, after three months, we're not sure yet, but let's just say, assume that in the next visit, the patient was diagnosed with, oh, sorry, with cough and chill. So, so both are two diagnosis codes. And then in the final visit, the patient was, was diagnosed with fever, prescribed with Tylenol, and then was, and a went through a chest x-ray. So this would be a procedure. So one diagnosis, one medication, one procedure. So this would be like an abstraction of a patient. Of course, there could be many, many more different information about the patient, like, you know, the DNA sequence of a patient or, or the age of a patient or the gender of a patient. So age would change over time, but the gender would not change over time, something like this. So there could be many more features, but we're just gonna simplify this Simplify, simplify the situation and we're just gonna deal with the medical events that happened or that occurred within each visit. And we're gonna just handle multiple visits over time. So given this as a patient, so this is a single patient. What we're trying to do now is to try to predict after the last visit, whether the patient would receive a heart failure diagnosis, so whether the, pa whether the patient would develop heart failure within three months after the last visit. So this would be our setup. So this is a heart failure prediction, but this could be any prediction. It could be heart failure prediction. It could be hypertension prediction. It could be kidney failure prediction. It could be even mortality prediction. Anything could, you know, you could predict anything you want, or you could even recommend drugs, you can recommend procedures, whatever you want. So the what you predict is not really relevant in this, in this example. What is relevant is how to handle a sequence of a sequence of visit information. So what's important is how can you learn a good representation of this? So what we're trying to do is based on this information, trying to predict something, which is in this case, heart failure. So the important thing is how can you learn a good representation of this? So before each visit was represented as a 40,000 dimensional vector. So given that, how can we do better than that to learn a good representation of this? So then we have a representation, which is hopefully a fixed size vector. We can push that into a computer and then the computer would, would, computer would be able to well predict the heart failure diagnosis. So uh, the classical machine learning would be more or less the same as what we did before. So a feature, uh, besides that there's, uh, so what, what more or less the same with the previous approach that we took with the logistic regression, but on top of that, we need a bit of feature engineering if we were to take classical, like you know, the old school way instead of the deep learning way. So since we're trying to predict heart failure, what we would need is there would be a cardiovascular uh, expert a physician, so who, so a doctor whose major is cardiovascular problems. So we would ask them, the doctor, like what would be an important feature to predict heart failure in the future? And that the doctor would say, okay, so we need to take a look at if the patient had, had been diagnosed with arrhythmia and if the patient had been diagnosed with respiratory failure, if the patient was prescribed with diuretics. So this is a, a bit of a type of medication. So the doctor would tell us uh, all the different important features that would make us, that, that would make it, make it easier for the machine to predict heart failure. So that would be feature engineering. And then the IT engineer would encode that into a computer using a programming language. So the first, so in that case, like the first dimension would be the number of times the patient had been diagnosed with arrhythmia 
uh, second dimension would be the number of times the patient had been diagnosed with respiratory failure, something like that. So each feature would be like, a, I mean, each dimension would represent a, a feature chosen by a physician. And that would become our patient representation vector. So this fixed size vector would be a representation of a patient experience over a lifetime or maybe like a, over a very long period of time. And then once we have that, we put that through a logistic regression and then we would be able to tell, yes, the patient would develop heart failure within three months or no, the patient would not develop or not, would not be diagnosed with heart failure within three months. So this is the old school way. But in deep learning, as we've seen so far, everything can be a vector because in the previous uh, chapter, in logi the in the vanilla logistic regression, 40,000 dimensional vector was a fixed size vector that represented, a, that represented a single admission. But when we put that through a hidden layer, we were able to obtain a four dimensional vector. So a vector that lives in a four dimensional space, that which is again, our hidden representation or a latent representation of an admission. So admission is a vector and in the same manner, a cough can be represented as a vector. A Tylenol could be represented. So any, any event, any medical event, any feature can be represented as a vector. So you can think of this as a, a word embedding. So if you're familiar with NLP, word embedding is every, every word can be represented as a fixed size vector. So in this case, in healthcare, similar manner, any medical event can be represented as a fixed size vector. So any diagnosis, medication, or procedure code. So which would be an n-dimensional, typically just as in, in the NLP, a cough can be represented as a maybe a 128 dimensional vector or 256 or 512, that depends on your application. And of course the specific values in the, in the vector are learned during trainings, learned by backprop. So if you are able to, or if your model well learns the representation vectors of each medical features or each medical events, then we would get a, uh, a, t a visual visualization like this. So what you see here is individual circles. So individual circles here are all a single diagnosis code. And of course there are thousands of diagnosis codes so that you see a lot of circles. And the colors, the pink, uh, the orange, the green, the light greens, the, the grays, they represent a high, high level category of a diagnosis code. So uh, actually, let me share a screen with you guys. Let me share uh, my web browser. So this is icv9data.com. So you can see, you can explore all the different icv9 codes. And if you go here, you see. So before, so we we've seen, we've gone through a couple of examples. Like if you go to 4010.9, 4010.9, that becomes a unspecified hypertension, essential hypertension. So this is a full four to five digit icv9 code. But if you remove the last sub, if you remove the sub decimal digits, then it becomes 401, 401, which is just hyper, essential hypertension. And if you go one more step up, then you get hypertensive diseases, which is 401 to 405. And if you go one more step up, then you get disease of the circulatory systems, which is 390 to 459. So this, the disease of circulatory, where, where, where is it? Yeah. Disease of the circular system. So this is the highest level of category. So this is like the most abstract, you know, abstract category of all the disease codes. And so there's like, it's like a hierarchy. So in the very top, there's just disease code. And then it, right beneath a single disease code, there are about 17 to 18 disease categories. And if you choose one, then that, that you know, then, then you go into subcategory, and then if you choose what you go to sub subcategory, something like this. So it's a, like a tree structure. So this this here, this 17 to uh, 17, 18 categories are the highest level category. And what you're seeing here in the in the slides is that category. So uh, all the blue, all the pink. If you see, if you look at the all the pink ones, 
the pink ones are all about like you know bone fractures or like uh bone fractures or complications something like something that happens to your body uh, like physically not not mentally physically so all so all the pink ones are like that and if you look at some the pink one the clusters of pink ones so there are several clusters of pink diseases uh, you can see that these are all related to complications of surgical procedures or medical care so this is so pink ones are pink represent a actually let me let me actually show you what pink ones are so i would say the pink ones are uh, injury and poisoning I, 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 yeah i would say injury and poisoning Actually, the categories are not borrowed from IC9 code. It is borrowed from CCS9. CCS2. Yeah. Sorry about that. Just give me a second. Actually. So IC9 is a coding system, but there's another coding system called CCS, which is Clinical Classification Software for IC9 CM. So this is like a like a mapping between IC9 and CCS. So if you go to multi-level diagnoses, this is a this is again like a tree structure. So it's like a there's like a one-to-one -one mapping between CCS CCS coding system and the IC9 coding system. So this is a single IC9 code. So it's 101.00. So if you go to the bottom, there must be so 17 symptoms, 16 injury and poisoning. Yeah, okay. So okay, so 17, okay, so. 16 is injury and poisoning is the is the pink ones but we're all the pink ones so all the individual like like all the codes here like 716.010716.11 all these are individual ic9 codes and every like a lot of them like until until so uh, there's a lot of them so yeah before 17 so everything on from here i mean everything from the top that starts with 16 all the way to here is all the pink codes that we've just seen in the in the slides. And you can see a subcategory. So underneath injury and poisoning, there's joint disorders and dislocations. There's uh, fractures of neck femur. There's fractures of upper limb, uh, other fractures of upper limb. There's fractures of lower limb. So there, these are all like fractures. So if you go back to the slides, so the pink ones are uh, injuries and poisoning. And you can see that uh, fractures of lower limb and fractures of upper limb, these are the ones that you've just, so this is like a subcategory underneath injury and poisoning. So you can see, even though the pink ones are all, all injury and poisoning, the ones that form a cluster are coherent subcategories. They are coherent clusters that fall under the same subcategory. So you can see that uh, all, all the pink ones are here are related to complication of devices and implant the graph. All the, all the features are like about, you know, so it's, uh, uh, so it's, a, it's a like, a, so even though we have not actually injected any domain knowledge into the model when training with the, you know, when training for the feature vectors or the disease embeddings, even though the machine, we, we did not actually tell the machine that, you know, like these are all fractures. And so, and like all these codes, so we didn't tell that the that individual, these codes are all lower limb and these codes are all upper limb. We didn't do that. We just let the model learn from whatever this supervised task, for example, heart failure prediction. And, uh, and the model would figure out the relationship between different disease codes and then when you plot that, or when you visualize that in the two D two dimensional space, then you would get a very nice looking visual, uh, nice looking two scatter plot like this. So it means that the machine is able to figure out some domain knowledge in a pure, purely data driven fashion. So that 
even if we don't know the use, even if the developer, the machine learning engineer, the AI researcher, even if we don't, if, even if we don't know any medical knowledge, the machine can capture something under that lies underneath the all the, all the like gigantic amount of that. So that's the spirit of deep learning, basically. All right, moving on. So, so again, so if, how we how can learn a good representation of this? Back to the original problem. So instead of doing going with the classical way, we go with the deep learning way. So we just establish that any feature can be or any medical event can be represented as a fixed size vector. So cough can be converted to a vector. Fever can be converted to a vector, all the way to a chest X-ray here. So everything is a vector. And since these four vectors, these four events occurred within the same visit, visit one. We sum them up, and since these two occurred within the same visit, we sum these two up, and we sum these three up. So anything that happened within a single visit is just you know summed up, and that essentially becomes a visit representation. As I said, anything can be represented as a vector: the individual diagnosis codes, a patient, a visit. Uh, so for example, in the previous example in the readmission prediction we represented a single admission as a 40,000 dimensional vector, but here we are using a fixed size, maybe 128 or 256, it's up to you, whichever size of vector, whichever size vector you want. We, we, we fix that vector size, convert each feature into that vectors, and then we sum them up, and then that becomes our visit representation. So this is visit one, this is visit two, this is visit three, so on, so on and so forth. And then once we have the visit vectors, we can put that into the RNN. So since, because visits have orders, visit one occurred before visit two, obviously, and visit three comes after visit two. So we would like to, when aggregating, when aggregating these three visit vectors to represent a entire patient, we could either, we, we could simply sum them up just like we did with, with this example. We could sum these up, uh, like we summed up the individual medical features. We could sum up all the visit vectors, visit one, two, three, sum them up to, derive or obtain a single patient representation vector. But that would be suboptimal because simply summing them up is like bag of features. If we sum these three up, it means that we don't care about the order of events, about, about the order of vis visits. So what we would rather would like to do is push them into the RNN where RNN is obviously a sequence encoder. So any model, uh, it doesn't have to be RNN, actually. It could be one DCNN, it could be transformer, it could be anything. But as long as you have a aggregator function that respects the order of input, that is fine. So, but in this case, we're, we're just going to use RNN, which is the the, the, the most, most popular, popular uh, predictive model in healthcare still. So we put visit one into the model, two, three in order into the RNN, and then we, we would have the corresponding hidden layers at each time step. So, right, uh, this is a bit of a, a preliminary introduction into to the RNN, but we're just gonna... Uh, okay, I'm just gonna go through them just as a reminder, if anyone is kind of blurry with the uh, details of the RNN. So RNN is just, it, it's a, Sequence encoder, so it is developed to process sequential inputs. So anything that has a sequence, like you know, text, where a single sentence is a sequence of words, factory sensors would generate sensor info, sensor values every single I don't know, like like second or minute or hour. So that would form a sequence. Stock prices are also sequence. Like every time, every like every day, there is like a every day like there there's like a stock price at the end of the market or the or the opening of the market. So that becomes like a, a day-based uh, sequence of continuous values. Medical records also is a sequence value, uh, is a sequential input. So uh, hopefully everybody knows what this is. So a hidden, a next, uh, ith, hidden layer of the ith step is obtained by linearly transforming a previous hidden layer and then current input and then there's a bias factor. So you sum them up. You first linearly transform the inputs, the previous hidden layer. You sum them up with the bias, and then you put it through a nonlinear activation function, which is typically a 10H in the vanilla RNN. So 
you reuse the W. So you reuse the W uh, matrix here, the weight matrix here, weight matrix here, the bias vector. So you reuse them at every at each time step. So you can process any arbitrary length of sequence. So that's the strength of RNN. So uh, in this case, so you can do a lot of things with recurrent neural networks, RNN. You can do sequence to sequence. Uh, you, can, you can do like encoder decoder fashion, sequence to sequence uh, prediction tasks, such as, you know, translation. You put English in and you put, uh, you get the, uh, uh, you get the German sentence out, something like that. But in this case, in our example, which is heart failure prediction, we would have a very simple setup. So we put our visit vectors into the RNN, as many visit vectors we have in sequence, we put them in. And then once you put all of them in, we would have the hidden layer at the last time step. So let's assume that we have uh, uppercase T number of visits, and then we put all of them into the, into the RNN. And at the last time step, we would have HT, which would theoretically remember all the visits from the past. So that would be our patient representation vector because the last hidden layer, HT, would remember all the visits so far, this would essentially be equivalent to a single patient. So we would assume that HT is the patient represent representation vector. And then we put that through a logistic layer and get a final heart failure prediction. So that is our setup. So, this is very far from what we did with uh, 40,000 dimensional vector. So, in so what we would what we would have done with the classical approach is you know select the features, count the number of times each feature each feature occurred within a long period of period of patient's lifetime, and then we would have a fixed size vector put that through a logistic regression. Instead of doing that, we would simply back we would simply track the events that occurred to the patient over time over his over his or her lifetime and then put the through RNN, then get the final hidden representation vector, which is the hidden layer of the last time step. And that is now our input to the logistic function. So that's the main difference. Of course, we would have, uh, we could do a lot of things with RNN. So uh, in this case, we could have a, a vi per, visit rep per visit prediction test, such as, will this patient die at each visit? Like, you know, we will have, we will put each, uh, we will put the visit vectors into the RNN and we will train it to predict whether the patient would die within or whether, you know, whether a patient would die within each visit or maybe something more, more less binary, something like, you know, the blood pressure at each visit, something like that. So anything that, if you want to predict something at each visit, then you would have, a, you would have multiple Ys at each time step. Uh, I'm going. Yeah, I'm going to. Go, I'm going to skip through this. All right. So modeling EHR with recurrent neural networks. So in this case, how we would do it is, so before what we show, what I showed you with you know converting each feature into a vector and then summing them up and then that becoming a patient uh, that becoming a visit representation vector is a bit of a a bit of a, like a uh, a high level uh, description. So we would let let's take a look at a bit more mathematical formula. So. This is the first, so we take one visit at a time. So we first take a look at the visit number one. So as I said, two diagnosis codes, one medication code and one procedure codes. Uh, so that would be represented as, again, a very long sparse vector. So in, you know, obviously if you want to represent this, there is no other way than to use a one hot vector in, in the very beginning. So after that, we would, you know, use a lot of embedding layers, but in the input, we would have no other choice. But I mean, this, this would be like the most easiest way to represent a, a discrete features. So we would, uh, so we would have to first prepare a four, about a very long vector, in this case, 40,000 dimensional vector. So I'm gonna assume there are 10,000 diagnosis codes, 20,000 medication codes and 10,000 procedure codes. So that would all, sum up to 40,000 codes in total. So we would have to prepare a 40,000 dimensional vector and each dimension corresponds to a single code. Could be a diagnosis code, could be a medication code, could be a procedure code. And since there are four features active 
in the visit in visit number one, there all the others would be zeros, ex except except you know the features except the dimensions that correspond to cough, fever, towel, and ivy foot. So this is again, uh, it's exactly the same thing as before. So we try we're trying to represent a single visit with a a multi hot vector. But if you and then instead of actually putting them through you know like logistic regression or whatever, we first put them through an embedding layer. So you can see that x1, you multiply that with a linear transformation with a with a wx, which is embedding matrix. So hopefully, uh, this is or theoretically this could be any. So this the output, the embedding output could be any dimension you want. It could be 128, it could be 256. Doesn't matter. Let's assume that for this for this example, we're gonna uh, use a 128 dimensional embedding vector. So every feature, every single feature is converted to a 128 dimensional vector. So in that case the dimensionality, the size of the matrix, the embedding matrix here would be 128 by 40,000 because the input feature X is 40,000 dimensional multi-hot vector and uh, W would have to be 128 by 40,000. So you simply multiply them as you, you, you do the matrix, you do the matrix multiplications and then you put it through a non-linear activation function or it could be linear activation. It's up to you. Again, this is a design choice. Whether you use linear activation, nonlinear activation, that's up to you. But in this example, I'm just going to put nonlinear activation function. So that becomes your visit representation vector. And if you remember, if you remember with the um, example with the one hidden layer, W X W transpose X is simply just use just selecting the rows of the W matrix which is active and summing them up. So that is why this process here, this process W transpose X, this process here is exactly the same thing as, as this. Selecting the feet, converting each feature into a vector and then summing them up. This is exactly the same as this, this process here, W transpose X. Hope this is clear. I mean, in the previous example, I didn't show you the nonlinear activation function, but you know, spiritually it's, it's exactly the same thing. And then once you have the visit, visit representation vector or visit embedding, then you put that into the into the RNN. So the into the RNN. So there's the hit for the H zero, which is the very the first initialized hidden layer, would be is usually a zero vector. So we don't add that here. So H one becomes like this, and then you put the second visit embedding. So visit two becomes a visit embedding, and then you put that into the RNN again. So now this time, it would the H uh, two would have the would be updated with this function, with this equation. You uh, keep doing that until you put you you have put the last visit embedding vt, and now your ht is derived like this. And then you put ht into the logistic function. So you put there's a a vector a weight vector wo transpose ht, and that becomes a scalar value. And then you put that through a sigmoid function, and then you have a binary output. Or, or actually it's not a binary, it's a continuous output between zero and one. So the one indicating, yes, this patient will have heart failure and zero indicating, no, this patient will not have heart failure. Right, uh, if you were to do a multi, you, you can, uh, yeah, this is a simple binary a binary classification. So it's uh, like, you know, heart failure or no heart failure. You can generalize this into multi-class classification, you know, like, what kind of disease would this patient get in the future? Or out of all the medication codes, what medication code, what medica what drug should should I recommend to this patient? Something like that. So if there are multiple outcomes, you can simply use softmax instead of a logistic regression at the at the very at the very last time step. So you would have HT multiplied by the um, matrix instead of vector, and then you have you put it through a softmax and then you get a multi-class out, multi-class classification output. Right. Uh, hopefully uh, so far it has been all clear. Uh, okay, a question. Okay, so the question from Chun Gyeong Yi. 환자마다 방문 횟수가 다를 수 있지만 환자 이름 비즈 1, 2, 환자 이름 비즈 1, 2, 3, 4. 다른 모델의 시퀀스 랭스는 고정되어야 할것 같은데 이럴 경우 어떻게 처리하면 좋나요? 위에서 환자 1의 3선 존재하지 않으므로 제로 벡터를 넣어주면 되나요? 
아, 네, 맞습니다. 이것도 그러니까 마치 그 NLP에서 시크, 센텐스 랭스가 다 다르면은 제로 패딩을 해주잖아요. 그래서 제로 패딩을 해주 얘도 이제 제로 벡터를 넣어주면 됩니다. 그러니까 아까 여기서 보여주셨듯 보여드렸듯이 네 여기를 이거를 전부 다 0으로 채운 다음에 그 다음에 이제 인베딩을 네. 그 다음에 이제 인베딩 벡터를 넣고 그 다음에 이제 그거를 다시 r n 에 넣고 이런 식으로 이제 넣어주게 됩니다. 그래서 제로 벡터를 제로 네, 아니면 뭐 처음부터 얘를 그냥 제로 벡터로 세팅해 이 v 1을 v 그러니까 이제 v 뭐 i가 되겠죠. 어, 환자 1의 경우 이제 v3, v4를 아예 처음부터 그냥 이 제로 v1, v0, 그러니까 제로로 채워진 v로 만들고 그 다음에 아래에 넣어도 되고요. 네, 그렇습니다. 네. So yeah, so the question was, uh, so obviously in healthcare, people would have different number of visits over time. So in this case, if you look at chat box, uh, so patient number one would have two visits and patient number two could have four visits. So what, what, we, what would we do if we were to put them in the same mini batch, for example, then uh, the most uh, straightforward way you can do, what you can do is just zero pad the, uh, the visit, two visits for patient number one. So because patient number one has only two visits and patient number two has four visits. So the, the, and the remaining two visits for the uh, patient number one, we could just simply put them all, put all the, set them to, so you can set all, you can set these values to all zeros to represent fake visit number three and fake visit number four for patient number one. And then, you know, do the rest of the, do, do the rest of the thing in the same manner, which is exactly the same as the zero padding in NLP with, uh, you know, sentences or, you know, documents having different lengths. All right. So a lot of a lot of things, a lot of these things are very uh, analogous to NLP approach. If you are familiar with NLP, so the major difference between you know a sentence embedding and the patient embedding is that in the sentence embedding, at each time step, only one event or one feature occurs, which means that at each time step, there is only one word being input into the RNN. But in this case, in our healthcare example, or in this electronic health records example, multiple things could happen within a visit, like just like here. So within a single visit or single time step, multiple features could happen. And of course, the number of features that happen varies between visits to visits, obviously, right? So, you know, sometime in one visit, you could have, you could have, you know, In this example, like you know, four four features here, two features here, three features here. So, this is the major difference between NLP and healthcare. So, what I did in this example here is we what, what we did is simply just take the features within a single time step, add them all up to represent a single time step, and then we use that summed up feature. We we fed that into the RNN. So it's a bit it's like a two layer approach rather than a single layer approach. Uh, so there's the visit level, and then there's the code level. And the way that we handled the code level was a bit naive because we simply summed them all up. But you could, you could be, you could actually, you could also put another RNN layer beneath the visit level RNN. So underneath the code level RNN, you can simply encode them, like coffee or talent IV fluid. You can simply encode them into the un, like you know lower level, lower layer RNN or lower level RNN, and then derive the HT and then put them into the upper level RNN. That is also possible. So that is one, another way to handle this two level, like two layered uh, data structure. But then you would ask, would it make sense to put these four things into the RNN? But because there are not, there's no sequence between, I mean, there's no, there could be a sequence actually. There could be like, you know, maybe the doctor first diagnosed the patient with two, two uh, diagnosis codes and then prescribed the medicine and then, uh, you know, applied like IV fluid to the patient, something like that. So there could be a, like a, a implicit order of it, order between the features, but we would not know. There's no like ground truth, like sequence information given to us. We would not know that. So you could ask like, would it make sense to 
put these four features into the RNN to to derive a visit representation vector. And you know, the answer is, I guess that would not be optimal. But I'm just trying to say that that is one way to handle. So the the most naive way or the stupidest way would be to sum them all up, sum them all up like this, and then put them through RNN. A bit more, uh, a bit more like you know, uh, intricate approach, which whether it makes or makes sense or not, would be to put them through RNN, like you know, put them through RNN, get the HT, and then put them through uh, the uh, the visit aggregator from aggregation aggregation function. So that would be another way. There could be a million different ways actually. And since we could tr we could consider them, consider these features ha as having no orders. Between the between the features, like among the features, it's just a set of code, right? So a, a a patient is just a sequence of set of codes. Like it's just that within each time step, different number of codes, different features form a set, like unordered set. So what would be the best way to actually represent a set? That is the question. So we could either sum, or we could put them through as uh, RNN, or would that what would be the other way? What would like you know? What would be the most like optimal way to represent a set? Like how to handle a set? Any anybody care to take a guess? Yeah, no takers. Yeah, if this was a, an offline offline course, then I could, you know, uh, draw out participation by, you know, having candies or chocolates or something. But unfortunately, this is online class, and yeah, I can't do that. So, uh, yeah, we would we would get to this eventually when we talk about the two layer structures and the graph neural networks. But the most uh, in my in my estimation, the 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 approach that makes most sense when handling a set of a set of features or a set of codes is to use transformers. So uh, anybody who's taken uh, my course, the programming for AI last semester, we've established that transformer without the positional embedding is a set encoder because there the the because the self attention the process of self attention does not care about the order of input features. It's just everything, every feature is attending to all the other features uh, all the time. Like, you know, for, for all features, like each feature is attending to all the other features. So it's a completely, it's a connected graph or implicitly connected graph. So it is without the position, without the positional embedding, a transformer could be a nice, uh, uh, it would be like a perfect setup or a perfect model to handle this type of set of codes that varies over time. Does that make sense? 혹시 이해가 가시나요? 그 컨셉이? 컨셉이? Alright, that's... Oh yeah, Soro, you, you took my class, so... Alright. Okay, so hopefully that you know that makes sense i'm not going to go into the details because we will have time actually to introduce that but in if we if we were to use transformer to handle the code level information that would be again a two layer structure so underneath the visit we would use a transformer to handle the set of codes and then we would aggregate we would aggregate we, we will somehow need to aggregate the feature the 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 set of codes into a single fixed size vector so we could use like cls vector or something like that so and so that would be under so that the, there would be transformer living here in the lower layer and then there will be another aggregation function for example rnn living on the upper layer so that could be uh like a nice uh, nice approach to handle this ehr uh, ehr data structure all right so we'll move on Right, I think this is a bit of a 
a redundant, yeah, anyone who's re already fam familiar with uh, GRU and LSTM, this would be a bit of a redundant information. But just for those who are not familiar, I'm just going to quickly go through them. I think this is the last part of our uh, of our lecture today, is it? Yeah, it is. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So uh, yeah, so far we've uh, we've used the vanilla RNN as an uh, to in our uh, in our heart failure example, heart failure prediction example, where a H I so H two is derived with a very simple function that looks like this very simple equation where you linearly transform your previous hidden layer and uh, you also linearly transform your new input at that time step, sum them up, and then put them through a sigmoid function. I mean, no. Let's put them through a nonlinear activation function. In the original RNN, it was 10H, if my memory is correct. So that is a it's a rather very simple function. And in this case, if you are familiar with a van vanishing gradient and all that, you know, the, like it's just like a when we stack too many layers, hidden layers in the classical neural network approach without all the batch normalization, without the RAL use, or without the residual connections. If you just simply stack hidden layers too many times, then the signal from the top to the bottom would not, you know, the error signals from the top where the logistic, where the prediction layer lives would not be conveyed properly to the bottom layer, to, to the input side. So the, the gradients would either explode or vanish to zero in the process. So same thing could happen because if you look at this, if you look at this, if you turn this, turn, uh, if you rotate this structure 90 degrees, then you, it, it is exactly like stacking multiple hidden layers. It's just that at each each layer, new information is being injected. So that's the essence of RNN. You have multiple layers. The number of layers would be the, would be the same as number of time steps. And each layer is injected with new information. And of course, when you move from one layer to the next layer, you convey the information from the previous layer. So start. So if you were to predict, if you were to make prediction at this layer, then the error signal from this layer, the prediction layer, would have to be conveyed all the way down to like all the way down to like here in the first to the first layer. And in the because of the same reason, uh, the gradients or the error signals might go to zero or might explode. So the vanishing gradient or vanishing exploding gradient uh, problem still lives with RNN as well. If you have too long sequence as input, so in order to, in order to, uh, in order to overcome that, a uh, couple of uh, there are some so, uh, there, a couple of models have been proposed by very uh, famous researchers and actually Alice before GR so GRU we. Uh, I'm introducing GRU first. There, so it, the the models that overcome that vanishing gradient or exploding gradient problem are there are two representative representative models. One is LSTM, the long short term memories, and another is gated recurrent gated recurrent unit GRU. So LSTM and GRU, and historically LSTM was developed earlier than before GRU. So LSTM was developed in the early like 90s, like 90. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. Do I have that here? Yeah, I don't have that here. So or maybe like late 90s or mid 90s or something, like almost like 30 years ago by now. So LSTM was developed way before GRU, but I'm introducing GRU first because GRU is a bit structural, structurally a bit simpler than LSTM and it does exactly the same thing. So spiritually, GRU and LSTM are not that different. So GRU was developed in 2014 by a very famous uh, researcher Kyung Yeon Cho, who's Korean, uh, and when uh, GRU was developed at, to, in order to do uh, machine, like neural neural machine translation (NMT), so translating French to English or English to French, something like that. So it's an encoder decoder approach. And if you if you use vanilla RNN as the encoder and the decoder, then it would not work that well because you know a single sentence would be you know, 20 words or 30 words. So it's a bit longer than what vanilla RNN can take. So uh, Dr. Cho came up with GRU and then it's a bit more, so it's a bit more complex than unit computation in your return. So th this is a very simple computation, you know, mo moving from a T minus one to T is a very simple computation. 
So GRU is a bit more complicated. The main idea is to keep around memories to capture long distance de dependencies. So we want to capture long, de like a relation that lives through a longer time steps. And we allow error messages to flow at different strength depending on the input. So what we, the, the idea is that you, you have like a lot of input, you have like capital T number of inputs and some of the inputs are not really important. And some of the inputs are really important. You know, not all inputs are equally important. Some you have, some you want to forget, some you want to remember. So that's what GRU does. So depending on the input, uh, the, mem the model would decide whether to forget that input or not forget that input, something like that. So in order to do that, there are two gates in GRU. So there's something called update gate and there's something called reset gate. So two gates. And these gates are the ones that allow or this gate, the gate, these are the gates that control whether to, you know, propagate the information to the future time steps or whether to uh, forget the information. So this is like a, like a, this is called gate because it keeps or lets the information pass through to the future time step or not. So, uh, update gate and reset. So you can see that the update gate and the reset gate are calculated in, calculated in the exact same manner as, as this guy. So you can think of gates as like intermediate, intermediate layers or intermediate uh, uh, hidden layer used for used for controlling the flow of information. So uh, the only thing that's different from the previous HT example with in here is that the, the nonlinear activation function in the previous slide was 10H, but here the nonlinear activation function is, is sigmoid. It's a sigmoid function. It is actually a sigmoid function. So that means that all the values of Zs would be between zero and one, and all the values of R would be also between zero and one. So it has to be between zero and one because yeah, semantically, uh, yeah, we have this, we have it, we have it here. So HT is what we, so HT minus one is what we have. And XT is the current input, input to the, at the current time step. And HT is the one that we want to eventually derive as the representation of this time step, right? So before going there, there are a lot of computations. We first calculate ZT, we calculate RT, which are the update gate and reset gate. And we calculate something called a intermediate uh, memory, H tilde T. And you can see the H tilde T is a bit different from these two. So it, uh, the, it is a multiplication of current, uh, a previous hidden layer. You, multi you, you, you element wise multiply that with the reset gate. So in this case, if RT, I said that RT ha has a value between zero and one. So if our values of RT were all zeros, what would happen? If this was, if the reset gate was completely zeroed out, then what would happen? That means that this term would go to zero, this term would go to zero, and only this term would survive. And which means that H tilde T would only be affected by the current input. So that is what reset gate does. So if, if the reset gate is zero, it means that all the things that you, you have remembered so far is irrelevant. It goes to zero, it is wasted. But if the reset gate is one, it is completely one, then this term would survive and it would be mixed with the current input. And then that would be then, so your H tilde T would be affected by both your current input and your previous out, uh, previous uh, time step, previous hidden layer. So that is what reset gate does. And the final memory. So once you have the H tilde T, you use that to derive the final H T. So you can see that here H tilde T and H. So it's a convex sum. So there's H tilde T here and H T minus one is the previous time, previous hidden layer. So this time Z T controls how much you want to use H tilde T and how much you want to use previous time, previous hidden layer. So if Z T, the update gate is one, if all the values here are one, what would happen? It, it would ha what would happen is this term would go to zero. This term would go to zero and only this term would survive. So your current hidden time, your current hidden layer would only be affected by your previous, previous hidden layer. And it is not just affected, it is actually copy. If you think about it, if ZT is one, 
this term would go to zero. This is one. So HT equals HT minus one. So it means that you're simply carrying over your previous hidden layer to the current time step. That's it. So if your ZT is, that is why GRU is so well, it, G, GRU can actually convey the information to the far, far, far into the future. This is why GRU can handle long sequence uh, input. Like, you know, sequ in, sequence input that is like long time steps, like, like 50 time steps or 100 time steps or 200 time steps. That's, GRU can handle that because of this, this mechanism. On the contrary, if ZT was all zeroed out, if update gate was zero, then this term would go to zero and only this term would survive. So H tilde T would survive. So H tilde T uh, depend, relying on reset gate would be affected by either this time step only, or maybe it would be a com combination of this time step and the previous hidden layer. So ba basically these two gates handle how much time, how much information, how much uh, previous information you want to use and how much previous, previous information you want to carry over. So that's gated, gated recurrent neural network. Hopefully this is pretty clear to everybody. Right, yeah, this, this reference was borrowed from the Stanford C224D 2, lecture, which is deep learning, which was near, uh, NLP for deep learning. Or, or was, it, was it deep learning for NLP? I think it was deep learning for NLP, yeah. So deep learning for natural language processing. I think 224D has become now 224N, which is NLP same thing, but anyway, so if you're interested in, if you want to, you know, uh, review these the, this material, you can go to this this website. Uh, LSTM is a bit; it takes the GRU a bit far. Uh, so it's like what there's takes a bit go, go one step further. So there's one more gate. So I mean, historically, it would be inappropriate to say that LSTM takes GRU a bit step further because actually LSTM came before GRU. So you can say that GRU took LSTM and, simpli and just simplified that. So that would be an appropriate description. So there are three gates now instead of two gates. There, are two, there were two gates here. There are now three gates. So three, it's called uh, input gate, forget gate, and output gate. So the names are all different as well. And you can see in the very similar manner, like, you know, the gates, update gate and reset gate being calculated with a simple simple update, uh, simple equation. Uh, RT, uh, this is the same thing here. So that all the gates follow the same. Uh, oh, I forgot to say that even though they follow the similar looking equation, the, the, the weights that are used for calculating individual gates are different. So the matrix, W matrix here, where is it? W matrix here and W matrix here are different. It's WZ and WR. And of course, the U matrix and U matrix here are different as well. So they're, they're separate, separate weight vectors. I mean, weight matrices. And in the same manner, using three different weight matrices, W, I, F, O, U, I, F, O, you calculate IT, the input gate, FT, forget gate, OT, alpha gate. And they are all using, obviously, sigma function because they are they are gates so they need to control the flow of information and there is something called uh memory so before here h tilde we just call we call it uh, like intermediate memory but the this h tilde is not really useful in gru like people don't actually use that but but in in lstm there are two memory components which is actually called memory ct and hidden layer or hidden state HT. So if you look at the PyTorch LSTM function, you have two outputs rather than one output. So you have two outputs, memory and hidden layer, hidden state. So there is intermediate memory CT, C tilde T, which is calculated in a very similar fashion. Uh, so and so instead of using sigmoid, sigmoid function, you use 10H, and then you use a, mult, a lot of gates and uh, you use a lot of gates and this uh, me intermediate memory C tilde to derive the final memory cell CT. And then once you've done that, you use it once again with the output gate and the 10H function to derive a final hidden state HT. So you can see that forget gate is being used here, input gate is used, being used here, and the output gate, output gate is being used here. And of course, depending on what kind of value individual gates take, uh, the flow of information would, would vary. So. Personally, I, I kind of prefer GRU over LSTM because it's just simpler. There's lesser number of 
learnable parameters. And uh, I, I'm not really sure when, where to use memory cells actually. So I kind of find it not really essential. So that's why I kind of use GRU whenever I need to use like an RNN, RNN variant. But that's that's but that's me. So if you're, uh, it's just a like a personal preference. If you want to use LSTM, that's all. That's totally fine. Yeah. Um, if I yeah, depend according to my recall, according to my memory, there were some papers that tried to compare the performance between LSTM and GRU back in like 2015, 2016. And I think the conclusion, or at least like the qualitative conclusion, was that it's more or less the same. Like you know. Depending on which task, sometimes LSTM outperforms GRU a bit, and some other tasks, GRU outperforms LSTM a bit, but more or less they're the same. I think the more important thing is actually the hyperparameters. All right, so yeah, okay, so today we ended a bit early. Hope, thank, uh, thankfully, yeah, so we were able to finish all the things I prepared so far before we go to the, before we meet next Thursday and talk about the specs, because talking about the specs would take some time. It's not a because uh, we need to go through, we need to define a prediction. We need to find a prediction task. And then we have to go through the tables of VIMIC 3 and then decide how to extract the features or what kind of features are recommended to extract. And then, you know, how to, how to calculate, uh, how to uh, calculate the performance and how to submit the codes and all that. So it's gonna take some time. So hopefully we could get that done within one session next, uh, this Thursday. Uh, all right, any questions so far? So this is all, I mean, theoretically, this is all you need. So this is like GRU and LSTM is a bit uh, like additional. So un, up until here, this is all you need to uh, do your own prediction, uh, prediction tasks, do your own projects for any prediction tasks. So if I were to, you know, say, so if I were to give you like readmission prediction as our, as our uh, project and then define the define the inclusion exclusion criteria or the case control criteria like who becomes the positive sample who becomes the negative samples and uh, if I told you like which features to use you would be able to make you would be able to use RNN function to uh, make a prediction pre uh, uh, a readmission predictor model if I were to give you like mortality prediction as assignment then you would be able to do that theoretically because I throughout the past two weeks or so this that is all i've you know lectured so far is essential information to be able to do all that so hopefully you know uh, when i describe the describe the uh, the first project nobody is like you know wondering what they have to do or have no idea what to do hopefully that's not the case so if you have any question please ask them now because uh, we don't want to waste any more time with the prediction, like simple prediction, prediction tasks. Okay, there was a chat. Sorry. Aka, uh, question from Hanji Huang. 교수님 질문 있습니다. 아까 좀 말씀해 주신 visit data RNA dash transform 적용해도 좋은 이유에 대해 다시 한번 말씀해 주세요. Yo, 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 bubu, my smash in gong, right? Yogi, so Segaka, the co e PGs, you can use it PG structure, EHR, like Kujoga, two layer of my some hetan, we have PGs and Shigan Suns of the Hulogago, the PG, 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 Shigan Suns of the Hulogago, Kubite, is a Yoroge, Koduga, Hanbone, Han Time Step, Yoroge, Koduga, by Seganica, is a two, two level architecture, Kajo in the 지금 요, 요 지금까지 제가 말씀드린 설명해드린 방법론은 이 밑에 코드의 그룹 코드의 그러니까 집합이죠 집합 이거 이제 집합 순서가 없다고 생각하고 집합이니까 집합을 그냥 단순히 얘네들 다 그냥 개개별로 인베딩을 변환하고 그 다음 더해서 집합을 하나의 벡터로 만들어 버리고 그 다음 그 벡터가 이제 요 타임 스텝의 어떤 그 표현 벡터 레프레젠테이션 벡터가 되고 그거를 아래에 넣었었는데 그렇게 하지 말고 요 벡터를 단순히 더하는 게 아니라 더하는 건 너무 단순하니까 더한 게 아니라 이거를 벡터 하나 하나를 RNN에 넣을 수도 있다라고 말씀을 드렸죠. 순서가 있다고 가정을 하고 순서가 있다 가정을 하고 얘네 얘네를 RNN에 이렇게 하나 둘셋넷 넣으면 이제 그네 개를 넣은 후에 히든 레이어가 나오잖아요. H4가 나오잖아요. 그거를 비짓 1의 
representation vector라고 생각을 하고 그 h4를 이제 다시 위의 레벨에서 비짓들을 모으는 RNA에 넣을 수 있다라는 얘기예요. 그 이제 여기서 나온 h4를 여기 두 번째 RNA는 h1에다가 넣는 거죠. 그렇게 해도 된다. 그렇게 해도 뭐 작동은 잘할 거예요. 근데 그건 약간 이상하다. 왜냐면은 이네 개를 이 aggregation 할때 쓰는 RNA를 쓰는 건 약간 이상할 수도 있는 게 얘네 사이에는 사실 어떤 순서가 명확하지가 않거든요. 순서가 있을 수도 있지만 순서가 명확하지가 않을 수도 있기 때문에 그래서 순서가 없을 때는 차라리 RNA를 쓰는 게 아니라 트랜스포머를 써서 트랜스포머를 써서 얘네 네 개를 셀 포텐션으로 묶은 다음에 어떤 CLS 펑션, CLS 벡터 같은 걸 만들고 그거를 이제 이 비짓 1의 레프레젠테이션 벡터로 취급을 해서 그거를 요 위에 레벨의 RNA 1에다가 넣고 얘도 트랜스포머를 넣어 트랜스포머 돌려서 CLS 벡터 만들어 가지고 그거를 RNA 두 번째 넣고 여기도 CLS 여기도 트랜스포머 동시에 돌려 가지고 CLS 받아서 RNA 세 번째 넣고 그렇게 하는 게 제일 자연스럽다라고 한 얘기입니다. 혹시 이해가 되시나요? 네, 네, 좋습니다. Oh, and one thing I forgot to actually mention. So, the very important thing. So far, we've assumed that visit the dura time duration or time gaps between consecutive visits were the same, because that's uh, that's why we used RNN in a very you know naive fashion. So we assumed that you know visit one occurred today and visit two occurred tomorrow, and then visit three occurred the day after, something like that. Like you know, we were assuming that you know this the dura the time gap between the visits were the same, just like in sentences where each word occurs at each time step. And we assume that each word occurs exactly in the, in the regular time fashion. But in reality, that is not the case because patients don't visit hospitals in a regular manner. You know, sometimes they visit, you know, like, some, like I would visit today and then maybe after months, I would visit the hospital again. Maybe after the, after a year, I would, you know, like there, the time gaps between the consecutive visits are all like irregular and it's just completely arbitrary. So we didn't, ex we didn't address that uh, aspect. So, but uh, and the simplest way to handle that is to simply just, uh, so once you derive, once you derive the visit vector here, you could actually uh, append one or two more features or one or two dimensions that represent uh, represent the time duration between you know previous like time, the time lapse between since the last visit you know for example if the the time gap between these visit one and visit two were three days then you would put three as an additional feature here like three or you could actually put the log in front of it it's up to you but the simplest way is to actually put three and if the, the time gap between visit two and three were like you know two months then you would put 60 as an additional feature here. So that would be the stupidest way to, or most naive way to, to address the irregular time, irregularly timed nature of visit sequences. And obviously you could do way better than that. You could use like position embeddings from the transformer and then append append position embedding here, or actually you could you know sum the position embedding with the visit embedding, something like that. There's way more comp like, in, uh, sophisticated way you could do it, or you could uh, you could uh, manipulate the architecture of GRU like using GRU DK, or you could use you know neural ODs. There's way more like complicated complicated way to do it, but simply in this example we would not care about the time information. We would just simply uh, uh, assume that every each every individual visits happen in a regular time fashion. 아 변영진님, 트랜스포머의 어텐션, 셀프 텐션, 레이티브 포지션에 의존하는 것 순수 검사에서 어떻게 활용하나요? 트랜스포머의 셀프 텐션은 레이티브 포지션이 사실 존재하지 않습니다. 아, 그러니까 레이티브 포지션을 사용하는 거는 우리가 트랜스포머의 인풋 단에다가 포지셔널 인베딩을 넣어주기 때문에 그 인풋마다의 어떤 포지션이 주어지고 포지션 정보가 주어지고 그것 때문에 트랜스포머는 셀 포텐션을 할때 포지션 정보를 감안해서 셀 포텐션을 하게 되는데 만약에 우리가 포지션 인베딩을 주지 않으면 은 인풋 단에다가 그러면 은 인풋들은 서로 순서의 정보가 존재하지 않고 그러면 그 상태에서 셀 포텐션을 하면 은 순전히 셋에 대해서 셀 포텐션을 하게 되는 거랑 같아요 그러니까 셀 포텐션만 보면 은 걔는 어떤 노드들이 그래프에 노드들이 있고 그 그래프들의 노드들이 전부 다 
completely fully connected 그래프일 때, 그 그래프의 엣지들의 스트렝스를 데이터 드리븐 패션으로 어, 배우는 거랑 같다고 보시면 됩니다. 그러니까 그 포지션 인베딩을 빼버리면 돼요. 그냥 포지션 인베딩 없이 그냥 인베딩 넣고 그냥 셀프 텐션 하면 그게 마치 셋들의 정보를 이 믹싱 해준 거랑 같은 효과가 납니다. 혹시 이, 이해가 되셨나요? 네. 네, 혹시 뭐 이해가 안 되셨으면 그, 그, 클라썸에다가 올려주셔도 되고요. 아니면 뭐, 네. 클라썸 올려주시면 그 제가 답을 해드리겠습니다. 네. Okay, so I think this is the end of the class today. So, uh, if there are, if there are no more questions, I'll see you guys this Thursday. Uh, thank you and bye bye.